Good evening. Students of the law school, alumni, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the School of Law's 2016 Inception Lecture. I am Carol Tan, Professor of Law and Head of the School of Law. This annual lecture marks the start of our academic year. It was first introduced by my colleague, Professor Mashoud Badrin in 2011. He was then the head of the School of Law. The primary purpose of the Inception Lecture is to inspire our students. And our past Inception Lectures, delivered by the Right Honourable David Lammy, MP, Geoffrey Robertson, QC, and Baroness Hale, certainly provided inspiration and food for thought. And this year's Inception Lecture will be no exception. Our Inception Lectures are, of course, also public events. We are, after all, a publicly funded institution in a vibrant, intellectually minded city. And so if you're not familiar with the School of Law at SOAS, we were established in 1947 as the Department of Law at SOAS. SOAS itself, you may know, is celebrating its 100th anniversary this year. Between 1947 and 1974, the Law Department took in only postgraduate students, and it wasn't until 1975 that it enrolled its first cohort of undergraduate students. Our undergraduate intake was still only around 55 per year in the second half of the 1990s. This year, in contrast, we welcomed about 165 new undergraduate students and about the same number of new postgraduate students. The new students are part of a student community here at the School of Law that numbers over 500. Now, students come to us because we are a distinctive School of Law, one where undergraduate students can study for a degree that qualifies them in due course to practice in England and Wales, whilst also studying courses that focus on the parts of the world in which SOAS specialises, namely Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. They also study courses that challenge them to think about law differently as a result of its practice in the developing world. Many of our postgraduate students specialise in human rights and international law through a number of courses that pay particular attention to the post-colonial world. Our students are taught by faculty who are experts in their fields, and many of them combine scholarly work with engagement with government bodies and NGOs. Now, if you're a visitor to SOAS today, do visit us again, and do recommend us to potential students. I, for one, know not another school of law that is quite like the one I'm privileged to represent here this evening. Now, oh, it's not for me to take up more of our time this evening, save to do a few rather um, um, simple instructions. First of all, the fire exit's up there, and if the alarm goes off, please go in those directions. Um, please turn off your mobile phones so as not to interrupt proceedings. And finally, this event is being filmed, um, and I'm required to inform you of that. Um, I also would like to thank two people, Christine Jumper and Scott Newton, uh, two colleagues without, whom, uh, without whose efforts this evening would not be taking place. Scott Newton is looking after this lecture and, and also a series of other public lectures that we will host um, later in the year. In fact, please join me now in welcoming Scott who will introduce our distinguished speaker. Good evening, everyone. Welcome, distinguished visitors, friends, colleagues, and students past and present to the SOAS Law Inception Lecture. Now, this is a special iteration of a special occasion. It's the centenary year Inception Lecture, even though SOAS is 96 years older than this lecture series. 
and this is the fourth lecture in the series. It was established to serve as an inspiration for our students, contribute to public debate, and enhance our academic environment. I am therefore especially gratified to introduce as tonight's speaker a figure who emphatically ticks all three boxes. Michel Masseur, Queen's Counsel, renowned barrister, criminal barrister, and matchless defender of the seemingly indefensible. Now, Michel is an outsider who succeeded not only in making his way inside the legal profession, but in reaching the top of it, the supreme insider's outsider. He was called to the bar in 1979 and took silk 20 years later. Considering the circumstances of his arrival here, as a Jerusalem schoolboy sent for boarding in 1966, who reluctantly surrendered aeronautics for the arts, his success in cracking this notably hard cultural and professional nut is stunning. It is especially fitting that we have given Michel this SOAS Law Forum. Michel, of course, has a long-standing SOAS connection and has been a close friend, colleague, and partner of a number of us here over the years, particularly those with an interest in the Middle East and North Africa. But Michel's presence here is fitting in a deeper way, I think. For SOAS has, over the course of this eventful century, been transformed from an institution of the center and the inside to an institution of the periphery and the outside, by which I mean the global outside, the global south. Once upon a time, as you may know, we trained colonial administrators. Now we are taken up with the world colonialism left in its wake, and its claims and concerns and perspectives inform our scholarship and our politics in equal measure, if I, if I may presume to speak for at least a fair number of colleagues, both in law and across other disciplines. And of course, so many of our students nowadays, including a healthy contingent from Palestine, I should note, take a journey similar to that Michel took half a century back, although in notably greater numbers and with notably greater support, in solidarity, not as a solitary like Michel. I will leave Michel to tell you in greater detail about his unlikely outsider's career. Suffice it for me to note that compelling biographical incidents and personal qualities brought Michel to a career not simply in the law, but a career in justice, and those are only in rare cases the same thing. Occupation and then annexation of his birthplace shortly after his arrival here turned his natural advocacy skills, honed at speaker's corner in an age when the plight of Palestinians was not as generally appreciated as it has since come to be, into formidable adversarial and forensic arms. Michel gravitated toward criminal justice because at least ideally it is the arena where the great power disparities between the state on the one hand and the alleged defenders who are often at the margins of society on the other, where those disparities are neutralized, where equality of arms, at least notionally, where equality of arms trumps stark inequality in virtually every other respect, social, economic, and cultural. All defense barristers are in some basic sense taking on the establishment because their job is to challenge the state, to take apart the Crown's case. But Michel took on the establishment in an emphatic sense because beyond his defense of clients in murder, kidnapping, drugs, and gangland cases, he rapidly came to specialize in a class of defendants who have historically been held in particular opprobrium and contempt, including the IRA defendants and the Harrods and Brighton bombings, those accused of the Sudanese and Afghan air hijackings, the accused gunman in the shooting of the Israeli ambassador, and most recently, the defendant in the recently concluded fertilizer terror trial. And you should know, he got a lot of them off. Now, in championing the rights of what I just called the seemingly indefensible, Michel was, of course, doing what every defense counsel must necessarily do, to hold up the integrity of the adversarial system and ensure that it is fit for purpose and functions to purpose. But in developing his line in the defense of terrorism and related offenses, Michel was also engaged in justice in a more encompassing sense, in political justice. That is, in highlighting the sorts of historical collective grievances that often motivate those accused of such offenses and that distinguish them from others without redeeming or justifying them, mind you. So you should know that Michel has advised in international criminal cases as well, such as that of 
Omar al-Bashir, the president of the Sudan. Now, I've invited my colleague, Kevin John Heller, to serve as discussant. Kevin is professor of criminal law here. He's a notable authority on international crime and international tribunals. And he, as well, and he's the author of a number of books, including a book on the Nuremberg trials. He is also a professional colleague of Michel's in an extended sense, because he, too, has a lifelong career as defense counsel. And he has defended everyone from petty criminals to Radovan Karadzic in the ICTR, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. I'm sorry, the ICTY. Now, I, I, I've planned for Kevin to speak after Michelle does. I will, in fact, put a few questions to the both of them, and they can, in turn, respond. And after their, their responses to that initial set of questions, I will open the floor for questions from everyone else here. Now, I, I, I will say at this point, and I'll remind you when the time comes, please keep your questions succinct, and please keep them civil. I know that many of the issues here will provoke fierce passions, but I expect everyone here, including us up on the stage, to rein in those passions and to conduct our discussions here in an exemplary civil fashion. So without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Michelle. Thank you, Scott. Can I say, whenever I'm introduced in those terms, I always try to see who is he talking about, because sometimes it's difficult to recognize yourself. You know, they dig you out, and they go to the internet, and they check you out, and sometimes you say, well, who is this person they're talking about? It's so nice. Um, <laughs> I, I wish I had his qualities. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you to Sawas for inviting me to be here on this incredibly special occasion, the centenary and the inception uh, lecture. When I initially got the, the call from my colleague and friend, Dr. Jenkins, I was uh, touched. I thought she must have got the wrong Michel Massey because I thought she must be thinking of some Frenchman. Uh, and about that, I'll tell you a bit later. And then it dawned on me that what SOAS wants really is not to have some erudite discussion because I cannot follow the steps of Lady Hale and all these other guys who are very high powered academicians. I am not. Never been, never aimed, never tried to project I am. What I've done for 30 years, as my good friend Scott just now said, is I've tried to give voice to those who have no voice. And by choosing law and by choosing criminal law, I, perhaps in my own way, tried to bring awareness and fight a case and to bring a practical application to what you are studying. Lots of you are now fashionably studying human rights. I, at my time, we did not have that as an option. I, I don't know if we had, but I certainly did not have it. So uh, again, I'm very grateful to SOAS, this great, fantastic institution. It is a very unique institution. Uh, your director, uh, Lady Amos, uh, uh, who uh, I've met before, is a, a fantastic figure and is really a role model. She has achieved so much herself. She has been a foreign office minister, secretary of state for international development, and uh, Lord President of the Council. And so uh, this university that you are studying at is very special. Not only does it teach you, I hope, academically uh, excellence, but I hope, and this is my message to you, is I hope it will help you bridge the gaps that exist in our cultural understanding of what I call the other. Because a lot of the cases that we hear around today, be the UK domestic, the insane violence we see, the international unfettered violence that is being unleashed as we see it, I say that the root cause of it is a failure of dialogue. So what I would like you to have today as a message, as part of my message to you, I know the, the, the lecture has been entitled by my very brilliant writer, uh, uh, Dr. Scott Newton, to say uh, from the old city to the old building, we'll come to that later, but I have to deviate because it seems to me that part of your role 
as students here is not simply to study the ABC of criminal law and the ABC of land law, which I never understood, but that's another story. Uh, <laughs> it still defeats me, but it is to also understand how, how to get on with your colleague with whom you may not agree politically. And SOAS is, in my judgment, one of the best schools in the country, if not the world, which enables you to have this opportunity to debate, to engage, and not to exclude. There's a tendency, unfortunately, of exclusion. I don't agree with you, therefore I will not engage with you. I, for my part, when I was uh, your age, and perhaps younger, I always found it fascinating to actually engage with people who disagree with me. And in fact, I was invited very recently at uh, Oxford Union to take part in the Oxford Union debate. It was a very heated debate on the Israel-Palestine debate. The hall was packed, people were outside, this was being relayed. And uh, in the middle of my speech, one of my main opponents said, I'm swung. He moved over to my side. <laughs> I, it doesn't show that I'm a good advocate. It just simply shows that you really must engage with the other. Because you see, unfortunately, there's a tendency, as we all know, we tend to speak we tend to speak to preach to the converted. I've been to meetings where people applaud, but they applaud each other all the time. You never get new recruits. So I hope that part of what I'm saying to you today, all of you, you come out and say, well, I'm going to engage with my fellow student. I disagree with him or with her fundamentally on whatever issue it is that you're going to talk about. But engage, debate, study. I've had over 2,000 pupils and many pupils for the last uh, 20 years. And the one thing I always tell all lawyers, I, I forget it sometimes myself, is listen twice as much as you speak. Because if you listen, you begin to understand what the other side is trying to say. And by understanding, you might win the argument because you might find that little gem that is hidden in their argument, which may be a flawed argument. And so uh, I begin my... Uh, discussions with you today. I hope it will be an open discussion because I, my style has always been to engage and not to lecture from up down. I happen to be up, but consider me sitting or standing amongst you. And the main theme tonight I would like to ask you to consider, one of the main themes today, and the, 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 to go back to the title of, of, of the debate of the speech tonight, from the old city to the old Bailey. Do all of you know what the Old Bailey is? Yes, no? Yeah, well, it's the most famous, perhaps, criminal court in the world. So it's very nice, because I, I was, I'm from Jerusalem, I, from the old city of Jerusalem, but in fact, that wasn't where my parents came from. Um, my parents came from one part of Jerusalem, which is now called West Jerusalem. They became refugees before my birth, and so I was brought up uh, in what became the old city of Jerusalem, what, what is the old city of Jerusalem. And hilariously, uh, because we are Catholics, we are offered refuge in a Catholic hostelry. And the name, you'll be surprised about that, was called Casanova. <laughs> I, and of course, for those of you who speak Latin or, or Italian, it means not the Don Juan dancer seducing a woman uh, in Catholic Jerusalem. No, he, he was, uh, it's just the name, it means the new house. So I grew up uh, in this hostelry uh, we were eight people in a room. I remember till now we had to, they bathed you in a little um, kind of metal tub. So uh, as a child, my earliest memories of the old city were of displacement, of hurt, and of a deep sense of injustice. And of course, uh, my, my parents told the story how they fled one part of Jerusalem to the other part of Jerusalem with nothing except their, their, their suitcase because they were told you'll, you'll be back the following day. So I grew up as a boy looking over the part of the old city and my father saying, I don't know how accurate that house was, but it was certainly the most beautiful red tiled house. It may not have been our old house, but he certainly said, this is where we came from. And so I had this sense of grievance deeply uh, seated in me, and it developed in me the sense of how can, we re how can you correct a wrong? How does one correct a wrong? 
And so the idea, even at, the, at that young age, and my sister dug up when she knew I was coming to speak today, an essay I had written when I was about maybe 13, 14, about the need of justice and how can one implement justice and how does one implement and re retake, <coughs> forgive me, a, a right that is yours. Now, I don't know if any of you know the Palestinian story. It's a nice narrative. Every uh, Palestinian family has a key because every family uh, who, who, who left and was displaced took with them the key and they still, obviously, some of them hope to go back to that house. So I grew up uh, a little bit like a Woody Allen movie. We have an old rusty key uh, hanging from somewhere and we all have that key. So I grew up with that sense of, of grievance. How, how do you remedy it? And so I began to think of law. And a lot of um, uh, uh, Palestinians of my generation, in fact, became lawyers, studied law, became international lawyers. And I, um, uh, as I grew up in Jerusalem, I studied in a school which was French-run. In fact, till now, I still do, do my match tables in French. I cannot do three and three is nine. I do it in French because it was so drilled into me as a child. You know, trois, trois is enough. And so I grew up in that incredible atmosphere. But Jerusalem, as I grew, was an amazing city because, you see, you hear today of intolerance. You hear of people killing each other because they belong to the wrong religion. I grew up in a class where 20% of the students were Muslim, 5% were Armenian. But we never thought of each other in those terms. And the remarkable thing about Jerusalem, when, when I grew up, was this, there was this cohesion. There was no sense of the other. It was quite a remarkable experience, actually. And I don't know if any of you know the story of any of you have been to Jerusalem. I encourage you to go and, and to see. One of the most important accounts of Jerusalem and its history and why we lived that reality of peace and lack of hatred towards each other was one of the holiest shrines in the old city of Jerusalem, the Christian shrines, is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. You all know about it, or any of you know it? It is where legend has it, our Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. So it's a very holy place. And when Saladin entered Jerusalem with his commanders, one of them was Omar al-Khattab, and he was visiting the church, and it was prayer time. And the ones who were with him, they said, Omar, kneel and pray. And with his wisdom said, no. And he refused to pray. And he, <clears throat> forgive me, he left the church and 500 meters down the road, he knelt and prayed and they built an Umayyad mosque. Now the beauty of the story, it has remained the story in the culture of the people. And hilariously, as you might know, there are so many Christian communities who all want to share the Holy Sepulchre. And till now, there are fights about it, if you watch, about Easter time. And till now, not a single Christian congregation, uh, you'll be surprised to know, Scott, is entitled to have the key to the church because they, hit, they will beat each other up. So the only solution was an old Jerusalem family, Muslim family, the Nusaymas, <coughs> have got the key and ceremoniously every year at Easter, he comes with, a, with the key and they open it. So the point I'm saying about this, I grew up in a sense of tolerance and we had a sense of deep acceptance of the other, despite our displacement, despite the anger that people felt, our parents' generation, about the loss of uh, an occupation of Palestine. But the way we thought was redress, we thought was through law, through international law. There was a great love and respect for international institutions. And I think it's also a generational thing. There's this deep respect for international institutions, the United Nations, as the uh, resolver of all crises. So as I grew up in the old city, uh, one of the things to speak of Nuremberg was that great film, I'm sure you must have seen it, the black and white movie about Nuremberg trials. My uncle took me and it haunted me that despite the power of the, and the fascism of the Nazis, the horrors that they inflicted, the Holocaust and so on, yet they, could, uh, they were put on trial, they were uh, uh, tried, and that was something that had a deep effect on me. So from the old city, uh, at the tender age of 16, I come to London on my own. I go to boarding school, and I begin to discover that I hated the school. And I'll tell you why. Because I came from a family of foodies. And you know, Sunday lunch was an amazing experience. You know, my, I had seven aunts, and you know, we ate beyond life. 
And so you come to a boarding school in England. <laughs> I, I, in those days, I mean, now you have a choice. You can eat anything you like in London. I mean, you can virtually eat anything from Albania to Zimbabwe and back. I mean, you know, every variety is catered for, you know, including, you know, gluten-free. I mean, you name it, you have it. <laughs> but in those days, you had rubbish. I mean, all, all, <laughs> you had cauliflower, which was so overstewed, the neighbors would have shut their nose. It was just inedible. So um, I remember... Uh, <laughs> In those days, writing, there was no other means of saying to my father, I cannot survive in these conditions, take me back. And, um, and so I looked at the list of things. As, as Scott said, I came here to study aeronautical engineering. As a child, I used to build airplanes with mechano sets. I had a fantasy to be an air, you know, first a pilot. No way, I had short sighted, flat footed, it was not going to happen. <laughs> so I thought, okay, I'll build the bloody things. So I, I <laughs> and then I realized I was good in geometry. Um, and algebra, but I wasn't very good on, on physics. So, so when I came here, they said, oh, no, no, oh, it's a must, mate. So I thought, what can I do? I hate the food. What can I do A-levels in one year? In those days, you could. You, nowadays, you need, I don't know, four A-levels with 16 A's. But in those days, you could get in. <laughs> and, you know, with the, I said, what can I do? So I thought, OK, I'll do history, Arabic, which is a doddle, and French, which is a doddle. Okay. <laughs> so, so a career change, really, came because I hated the food. B, I wasn't up to doing physics. And then thirdly, I discovered, as Scott said, uh, this wonderful thing called Speaker's Corner. Now, as any of you would have known, I mean, you, you, have got, you are the internet generation. The TV. I came from Jerusalem. We had no TV. You know, I came here. The first TV was a black and white flickering. And we students, as you would imagine, fought on which channel to, to watch. But, so I, I had no knowledge of the other world, except what I had read in books. I was an avid reader of books. I would go to the British Council, and I would read books. So I, London was not foreign to me in the sense I had played Monopoly. Does anybody play Monopoly here? <laughs> so for me, you know, Bond Street and Whitechapel, this was, you know, I, you know, this was something I already knew about. And so I grew up in that kind of, uh, and I had heard about all this, the greatness about the guys, the parliament, the power of parliament. So I had read about it, but I had never, of course, experienced it. And so I thought, I'm going to go and experience a bit of London. I was very thin. I was so thin. I was so shy. If you said to me, boo, three times, believe me, I'll collapse. <laughs> no, no, and my friends who knew me from school would say, who the hell is this guy now talking? And so I had very big glasses, and, but seriously slim, thin. I mean, thin, thin. So... I went, I took, there was a bus called the 137 bus. My school was in a place called Streatham. And the, the bus took me to Speaker's Corner, to Hyde Park. And for me, I'd heard so much about it. This is the place where it gets anything you like, no restriction. You know, I grew up, I don't know if any of you remember your great grandparents having radios which looked like TV sets. Um, my grandfather had a radio set called Telefunken, which was honestly like one of those big television sets. And you know, it was flickering lights and so on. And, you know, he had to listen so that you know, the intelligence services don't listen to him. Uh, so anyway, I come here to the land because I hey, go to this amazing place. People on standing, shouting, screaming, talking in anything they like, attacking, criticizing. Amazing experience for a boy. Never, never. And who's very shy. I was so shy. Didn't take part in any school play. I just, that was how shy I was. And if you know Marble Arch, you all know, I'm sure you all know Marble Arch. Where Marble Arch is now, there's McDonald's. Right? But before McDonald's, there used to be a great tea house called the Joe Lyons Tea House. This boy never spoke in his life, never said boo to a goose, crossed the road to Joe Lyons Tea House and picked up a milk crate because in the old days the milk came in bottles, not in cartons. I picked up two crates, dragged them along, came up to the speakers, because they were, and they were great speakers, not like now. They were really people like Lord Soper, and the really powerful people were from the House of Lords that would come and speak. I, I don't know what motivated me. I just jumped on these two boxes, and my voice came, and started speaking, needlessly, <laughs> needless to say, about uh, what I perceived were the wrongs uh, afflicting the Palestinian people. And I discovered, not only that I could speak, but my God, did I say to myself, people are following. And then there is a creature, creatures in speaker's corner called the hecklers. You know what hecklers are. So as you're speaking in full, say, listen to you. They say, hey, Mike, have you seen your bow tie? It's got flies on it. They're just to distract you. 
So you have to be sharp, you have to be weak, quick to make a joke so that you are getting the crowds to laugh at him, not at you. And they would come sometimes in twos. So I discovered at the age of 16 and a half that, my God, I can, not only can I speak, I can also handle the hecklers and make the crowds laugh at the hecklers. And I was the only guy, Middle Eastern Arab, who spoke. It was, all very English, it was a very English spot. And they were obviously the, the completely mad religious nuts believing fire and hell. So, so. so I came in with a new message. And I remember I got my first kiss ever when I, this is a true story. I know it's being recorded, but it's the truth. So hallelujah. I took the 137 bus back to Streatham and it passed by King's uh, College uh, Hospital. And there was a nurse training and she said, I like your hair. <laughs> Moi? Anyway, so I got my first, I think, kiss, peck, peck, right? <laughs> to be precise as lawyers. And so um, I went back to the school excited. I spoke and said, I've got a girlfriend. Anyway, so, <laughs> anyway. so um, then, as Scott said, I began to study. And I discovered that during that year, um, the second occupation of Jerusalem took place. And imagine the impact on a boy of 17 this had. It completely shook me. Because now, uh, Jerusalem I grew up with, that was effectively uh, my solace, my home, my family. I just couldn't go back. And so my sense of injustice found its way back again to, uh, to Speaker's Corner. And so it was an interesting development, actually. So all my energies went back to this platform, and my technique of speaking, of debating, and listening to the other were honed in in this amazing place. And I can't encourage you to go now because sadly, I have to say, it's not of the same standard that it used to be there. But still, the concept of debating is so powerful. And so I, I developed this, what I would like to think, as an art form of releasing one's sense of uh, seeking justice by engaging with the other and saying, well, why do you say that, and so on. So my, my career as a lawyer is not like you do it. School, filling ACA forms, the statement, hoping you'll get in, quadruple uh, A-levels, interviews at Oxford and so on. And why do you want to study law? Oh, I've always wanted to do law because I believe in justice. <laughs> I, I didn't do that. I, I, I did not do that. You know, all these rehearsed. I know families pay a lot of money to train the children what to say. It's all rubbish, because I interview people too. So, uh, sorry to save your parents' money, but anyway. So, uh, so what I wanted to do more than anything else was I discovered, because of the war and the occupation, I wanted to work. And so this boy, who had never sort of really worked, uh, suddenly worked and went to Leicester Square. There was a chain of restaurants called the Golden Egg, and their menu was shaped like an egg yolk. <laughs> so I went in. I mean, things were easy in those days. I said, I want to work. Yeah, all right. Have you worked before? No. Nah. Oh, all right. So I started working. <laughs> and I loved it in the sense that I was earning some money and, uh, you know, having pocket money. But pocket money was, you know, like four quid a week. Wow. You know, you had... And by sheer chance, a, a, a BBC producer came in with his children to the Golden Egg. And then he said to me, from BBC Arabic, he said, your accent, do you, are you an Arab? I said, yes. He said, have you ever spoken on radio? I said, hey, radio, are you crazy? No, <laughs> come, he said. I want to do a voice test with you tomorrow. Now, you have to understand, in these days, people will worry because they're saying, you know, what is he doing? Is he, uh, is he gonna fiddle with my left tongue or something? Uh, so I went, I went to BBC, they liked my voice, and I started doing broadcast, that's not true, but I started doing two minutes a week. But my George, that gave you the sense of, I could tell people I'm on BBC, which was only two minutes, I would read the line like saying, I was doing science fiction plays and saying, whatever it is, some, some crazily named spacecraft has landed, you know. And they would have to do 20 takes because I would start giggling. Uh, <laughs> so, and I'll try to improvise like I now do. It's, 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 a, it's a disease, I've always had it. And so that gave me an, a, a kind of my voice, a slightly wider audience. Uh, as I was working in that field and the BBC, I obviously started and continued to work, uh, to study part time. And I uh, joined London University as an external student to read for the LLB. 
And I, of course, as you would imagine, we were working, beginning to discover London. I wasn't very assiduous in my studies. I'm not saying that's a good example. I'm simply saying that uh, by doing what I did, uh, it, it, hilariously, I managed to bridge the academic gap, which you do not need to go through, because can you imagine studying law, er, subject, hard subjects like uh, equity, without having a tutor to help you? I mean, you know, uh, I mean, th that for me is like torture. I mean, I still. <laughs> I, so, the, one of the other reasons I chose criminal law, not only because I felt this powerful need to help others, but because the idea of these cases of Ri Gulbin Kian 1, if any of you have doing equity, Ri Gulbin Kian 1, 2, 3, I mean, it will drive me insane. Constructive trust. What is constructive trust? <laughs> anyway, uh, um, anyway it, it was beyond me. So I studied hard, and I managed gradually, and I mean gradually, very gradually, because I was enjoying London, to study and to work and to read a, a lot. I was then offered a chance to go next door. I became a first year student at University College without ACA forms. One of my uh, contacts liked what I offered, so I ended up at University College. Luck, unfortunately for me, but fortunately for University College, I um, opted out because I was too involved in politics, student politics, and also began to be involved in uh, writing. So to cut a very long story short, I finally got my degree externally, how by some miracle my mother used to pray a lot and candles being lit. And, uh, <laughs> and so I, I, I passed my, but one of the uh, turning points of my life in this university, in this college here, was a professor, I'm sure uh, Kevin knows him, Professor B. Cheng, professor of air space law. And that, was, that subject had a grip on my imagination. Because when I was that age, the big issues of our time was landing on the moon. If country A, they always put the question, always, if country A's rocket lands on the moon and spacecraft lands and he comes out, to whom does the moon belong? <coughs> he must have had similar kind of prize. But that fascinated me. I said, yes, I can do that, because that's kind of sweet. And the other one was hijacking, because of course I'm a Palestinian, so I understood hijacking. So, so <laughs> and, in, and I was right. In, in the law exam, which I managed to get the first in, was of course questions on hijacking and the moon. So hey, it was a double. You know? And again, they had this hijacking, which was uh, uh, always what, what the question was. So uh, having finished my, 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 my law degree externally with a bit of help from uh, the Almighty and my mother's prayers. I took a gap year, and then I worked at an embassy, and then I qualified for the bar by studying for the, for the bar exams. I found that very difficult, uh, because I did not have the same kind of academic rigors that you have, but I finally did it. And then I was called to the bar. Do you, have you heard the expression, called to the bar? Now, you know it. Uh, I was being called to the bar, so of course in those days we had no other means of communication with, with Jerusalem except by telegram. So I said to my late father, bless him, at long last, it was, your son to be called to the bar, right? So, of course, at home, the postman doesn't only deliver, he reads, right? <laughs> because his English is not existent, but so he goes to my father and he says, in Arabic, Mabruk, which means congratulations, Mabruk, he says to my father, Mr. George, Mabruk, he says, I see your son has become a barman. But, hey, but, but he says, but he says, a degree is still a degree. But hey, it's a degree from London. Yeah. So, so, um, so I became a barman and, um, at, at the Middle Temple, which was a major experience. You know, they put the wig on you, and it's quite a moving experience. And the amazing thing I have to tell you is the moment I started practice, even as a young uh, pupil, because you are allowed to practice. I don't know if any of you know, but your first six, you are just following, shadowing your pupil, master, or mistress. The second six, they release you, and you can say, no. The instant I was on my feet, A, because I was older than my contemporaries by age, and also because I've had that amazing baptism of fire for years at Speaker's Corner, not, not, the court did not frighten me. So whereas my, most of my contemporaries who are 24, 25, if they just said, that, look here, Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith will go like this. If you said, to him, Mr. Massey, I'd say, yes. <laughs> so I, that experience actually gave me courage. So what I would say to you, if any of you are planning to be, become barristers or solicitors for that matter, if you want to practice here or elsewhere, do engage 
in debating societies. Do get involved in debating societies. Even if you don't have one, form a debating society and debate within the rules. If you need me to come, we'll set it up for you. But really, it's very vital that you get engaged in powerful debates. Because what that does, it sharpens your mind, trains you for the future, and gives you an ability to listen and to answer back. It's the most powerful tool, I'm sure. Uh, uh, professor here, will, uh, she's nodding in agreement. I always like nodders, uh, uh, especially on the jury. So I got my jury here. So I, I, I would like you to, to do that because it's one of the most powerful tools for putting into practice that which you have learned. So I began practicing in a very powerful set of chambers. I began, I was a pupil to the late George Kayat, uh, and he was very generous in every sense. And then I got to know Another person who passed away, the late Professor Eugene Cotran, who has got very deep links with this university, with SOAS, you know, a Palestinian like me from Jerusalem, an, an amazing uh, man. And I was a pupil in, in his chambers, and I learned so much from him. I was a pupil to uh, a man called uh, uh, Herendra de Silva and his namesake, um, Sir Desmond de Silva, who is now a QC. And so I grew up in that atmosphere where you learned by absorption. And I'm sure, I'm sure you all know but I, uh, the rules of how you become a barrister. You have to eat those dinners. And, uh, do, you know, do you know about them or would you like to hear about them? You know? Uh, okay. So I had to eat those dinners. And then I discovered whilst eating dinners that I would like to do more criminal work. So I began practicing uh, at the criminal bar. And it's so funny. It's funny. It's really, it's like I remember my very first case. And it was a miracle because a, a, a person I'm sure you, you must have heard of called Baroness Helena Kennedy QC. She is a, a very powerful figure. She is a, a writer on women's rights, a great fighter for human rights. I did not know her, but because I was speaking at the Students' Union debate, she heard me. I had long hair in those days, Afro style. And she said to her clerk, I cannot do this case, but I don't know his full name. He has a strange accent. He has long hair with a beard track him down, I want him to do this case at the Old Bailey. So my very first case was at the Old Bailey, which is pure luck. And it could have gone badly wrong. Um, because, you know, back to the speaker's corner. So the Old Bailey had no, so I, I did my first case, which was a return from my dear friend, Helena Kennedy, we became friends afterwards. And needless to say, as, as Scott would say, I won the case. And of course, it, it started me again on this career of criminal defense. And I stayed virtually at the Old Bailey, virtually for the, last, for the next 30 years. I did not leave it. I was lucky, but I fought hard. And I, if I say I enjoyed it, I really did enjoy it. I, it was the most incredible experience of life. It's a, an experience which is unparalleled because the English legal system doesn't have codification. It's difficult to understand its rules. But by George, the, the system works in practice. I, I've been to many countries. I've spoken in many countries. I've practiced in two countries other than England, three countries. I cannot think of any other country where your rights are as well protected as they are in England. That's from my personal experience, which is quite vast. And, and English law protects it because of these traditions which go back centuries old. So I began looking at how English law works in practice. And therefore, uh, my defense, as Scott was kind enough to say, of these ex extremely impossible cases began because I began to feel a sense that people who apparently have no defense have the right to be defended. And I was a young junior in those big cases that uh, Scott uh, mentioned. I, did, I was not obviously doing the leading advocacy, but I was what we call the junior. Uh, being uh, led by QC. And so that was a powerful experience. I was privileged to have been involved in some of the biggest cases this last 30 years. I mean, you named the case, and I was either a junior or I was a leader in the case. From the Hindawi trial, who tried to blow up the Al plane with his pregnant girlfriend on board, to every terrorist case you can think of I've been involved with, and, and every quadruple murder which will make storytellers salivate the first time. They all offer me all sorts of stories. But what I've learned from that experience, actually, and I'm going to throw this debate at you, one of the few things I've learned as a young lawyer, I was obviously very excited to be, there were not many uh, people of Arab origin at the bar, there was one other. 
So I was very proud. I would go around people say, what do you do? Oh, I'm a barrister. I was so proud, you know, I was excited about it. Because the one thing you learn as you become lawyers yourself, and if, you, if you're a doctor or a lawyer, you must never say to a lay audience, oh, I'm a lawyer, because, or a doctor. Because people immediately say, if you're a doctor, oh, I've got pain in my stomach. You're having a glass of wine. You're out of your brain, and they want advice about your stomach. And equally, if you're a lawyer, they come and say, oh, listen, I've got a problem. Listen, <laughs> can you not see? I'm, you know, it's my fourth glass now. And, they, and one uh, such story, which is a true story, I, this lady descends upon me at a cocktail party, and she said, oh, I hear you're a lawyer. Of course, I beamed, you know. I said, because now I never say. I say, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a painter, a hairdresser, whatever. <laughs> no, no, I do, because otherwise you, you get inundated. She said, I want to divorce my husband. I said, well, I, I don't do divorce. I'm a criminal lawyer. She said, no, 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 no. I, must. I said, please, no. She wouldn't go. She said, finally, if I kill him, will you get me off? <laughs> You know, I said, oh, how do you answer it? Because if you say, no, please, you are incompetent. If you say, yes, you're encouraging her. So I said, uh, you know, something about the weather in Japan or something, etc. So um, uh, it's, it's, uh, um, it's, it's a fascinating field, the study of, of criminal law and the practice of criminal law. So those cases that uh, Scott mentioned, that I will mention some of them, what I came out of it is for you to appreciate, and this is what, how I began. I've defended some students at universities who have been charged with serious terrorist offenses because they were misled and they joined, as you know, and it is one of the dangers of our society. And my, my strong message to you is stay away from anything that even nears anything close to or might be interpreted as violence or support of violence. Because firstly, it is wrong in law. Firstly, it is counterproductive. And thirdly, it defeats everything. I prefer to engage, engage, and engage. And I, I've learned my best lesson, not from court only, but one from the greatest figures of our time, Nelson Mandela, who <clears throat> spent so many years, he was a fellow lawyer like us. He was in Robben Island, and when he came out, of prison? Did he start with his people uh, taking revenge? Did they burn white people's houses? Did they burn African houses? They didn't. What did he do? What did he do? He, with Desmond Tutu, set up the Peace and Reconciliation Commission. And they set it up so people can unleash their, their hurt, but they start reconstructive purposes. I, I'm certainly no rugby player, because uh, there's a story about that, why not? But I don't know if any of you watched the Rugby World Cup when it was here, or watched it on TV. I mean, I, mean I, I could not believe my eyes, because the Springboks, which is the South African rugby team, was almost worshipped by the white community in South Africa. And to see a team composed of black players and white players, and the, the crowds cheering both the black and the white players for me, was earth, earth moving. It was just amazing. And for me, this is a symbol for the future. We should learn from how Nelson Mandela behaved, how he created that commission, how he created an area of future hope so you don't live in the past carrying grudges and anger. And I, I would like to say that the message of Nelson Mandela that he carried and that I would like through me to pass on to you as something palpable that you can yourselves, when you are um, going through your daily routine, remind yourselves, we are surrounded by wars, we are surrounded by acts of atrocities, we are surrounded by acts of inhumanity. If you look at the bombings in Syria, if you look at anywhere in the world, there are so many major crimes against humanity. The, the, the question that I always ask myself, having been part of the process, what is the best way of dealing with people like that? Is it the Mandela way? Or is it putting people on trial? Is it, th there must be a way to find some sort of dialogue. Because if we end the violence and the causes of violence by dialogue, in my judgment, we are closer to reaching a form of modus vivendi uh, with our fellow uh, uh, neighbors. Now, let me tell you about uh, my work at, 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 at the Old Bailey and, of course, the major structures which make me uh, a, a fighter for this. One of the major areas that I have found very impressive is trial by jury. 
And one of the reasons that English criminal system works, because not only do they preach it, it works. I'm sure some of you are doing criminal law at, uh, as undergrads or postgrads. But one of the fundamental principles is the presumption of innocence. How does it work in practice? You see, I have seen it work in practice. It's, it begins when the person is arrested by the police. His, the rights of the person when the police arrest him. What rights does he or she have? And so all this comes in to the process of how do you build a society based on the rule of law? How do you ensure due process? And I think criminal law is, in my judgment, the best vehicle for ensuring, in practice, uh, the rule of law and justice. Because any other form simply does not deliver that um, uh, amount of, I mean, which case, for example, you have, in, in many of the cases I have had to look at and defended in, the evidence looks almost unanswerable, unanswerable. And yet, by looking at the case thoroughly, you will be able to reach a conclusion other than the prosecution wants you to look at. Invariably, again, every dinner party I go to, invariably, I can assure you, invariably, and maybe some of you will have the same question, well, how can you, they say to me, how can you defend somebody and win the case and feel proud of it when you know he or she is guilty? Every time I get asked that question, it's like, you know. And of course, the answer to that is that, do you, do you, does anybody know the answer to that? No? No takers? No takers, okay. No takers at all? Not even one attempt? No? Not even one little hand? Yeah. Come on, guys, you are lawyers of the future. It was me over here. I was just going to say it's the right of protection for any individual. And how can my rights be protected if somebody like Rodan Carriage, like the guy from Sudan, if, there are, if their rights aren't protected? Well, that's absolutely, that's a question of principle. I agree. But if, if you look at it from a practical point of view, is that sometimes the prosecution forces the defense in a line of thinking that forces you to think he or she is guilty. Where you come in as the defense advocate is to look at the evidence and to simply look at it and say, does it stand up? I did a case when I was a young lawyer at the Crown Court called Knightsbridge. As you can see, I'm short-sighted. In fact, I'm very short-sighted. And I used to wear much heavier glasses. So it's like a movie, the story I'm saying, but it's true. I'm cross-examining this lady who could swear blind. She saw my, my client, she described him with accuracy, right? That he did the killing, okay, at a distance. Uh, as I was cross-examining, I noticed, and anybody who wears glasses, not these new cool ones, but the old ones, were very heavy. And they would leave implants here. And as I looked at her across the witness box, Scott, I noticed, it's like a movie, but it's true. I noticed these deep implants, Kevin, on her nose. And she, she wasn't wearing glasses out of vanity. So I said, excuse me, madam, you wear glasses. She said, what's to do with you, mate? <laughs> <laughs> I asked again, you wear glasses. She said, I'm telling you. Looks at the judge, asking for help. <laughs> what's to do with you? I said, madam, for the third time, you wear glasses. She said, what's to do with you, mate? She got very angry. I could see her, she's getting rattled by now. She looked at the judge for help. The judge said, oh, just answer Mr. Mas. He's bored with me also. <laughs> So I went for the juggler because I knew she clearly was wearing it. It was night. I don't want to put you the whole details. The point is, everybody thought her evidence was untouchable because on paper she had given absolutely impeccable evidence that she described him to E.T. But we, when she came to court, the glassy, she, it was, the incident took place at night. Nobody, not even I, wears his glasses at night. And so the whole case unraveled. Client acquitted in two seconds flat. Case dropped. And that shows you that you have to look at the evidence. And the whole point of studying law and evidence is to make sure that if you are defending somebody, that the evidence exists in support of the prosecution's case. And one, one of the things that I... Sorry about that. Uh, one, one of the things that I would like to add uh, to you is the question about the, the role of... Uh, in our justice system of the lawyer in making sure that those who are least likely to be represented in our days terrorism and those who are accused of sexual offenses. 
I mean, nowadays, sadly, to be accused of sexual offenses has almost become like uh, an impossible task to defend because there's an immediate stigma. I mean, look at the Cliff Richard story. Immediately, the whole media has already sentenced him before he was even a, dropped the case against him. So there is a role for good lawyers to take up cases which look unpopular. So I, uh, for my part, would like to, I, I had uh, wanted to discuss with you, uh, if I may, if anybody's interested, because I've written something about the legal aspects of Brexit, but maybe you've had it up to your ears from your tutors. But I, I, there, there's an aspect of Brexit which nobody discusses, and I think it touches upon the constitutionality and touches upon effectively what we are talking about here. The freedom of the individual, one of the greatest advantages England has is the supremacy of parliament. And people who do not appreciate that, many years back, big conservative politicians used to deride those who voted the referenda, describing it as a fascist exercise, describing it as a Franco-fascism, because you know, it's a populist thing. Whereas in England, we have, as you know, parliamentary uh, democracy, so that you elect your, 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 your MP, your MP votes accordingly. And this government has this insane fear of going back to parliament to decide on Article 50. Have any of you re read Article 50? Do you know what is Article 50? Or am I talking Greek? I'm talking Greek. Well, I just say two, two sentences. Article 50 enables any country which is part of the EU, it's if that country seeks to withdraw to, to, to start the negotiations. In order to start the negotiations, it says in black and white, that country must comply with its own constitutional position. Seems to me England is clear. Its own constitutional position, I would argue, must require the government to go back to parliament and seek parliamentary approval. That's a short point. But, uh, and the government is seeking to rely on the royal prerogative, which in my judgment, I think currently would be uh, completely uh, unconstitutional because uh, it simply will defeat it. Uh, and the major argument uh, against that is that by royal prerogative, you cannot deprive a citizen of a right he or she already has. Uh, all citizens of the UK have the right because of the EU and the legislation of 72 to vote in parliament, uh, the European parliament. They have the right to live in Europe. They have the right to petition the court. Uh, these are thoughts for you to debate amongst yourselves should you wish to do so at another time. So uh, we come to uh, uh, some of the uh, cases I have done. And perhaps we should leave that to, for question time, Neil, uh, 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 Scott. If you'd like. If you should we do that? Yeah, that I think should we do that. So I, uh, I would like, if I may, to finish on a perhaps more positive note and remind you of the power of the jury in England. And if you have never read it, please, by all means, please, please, please do try to read. It's online. Uh, the case of William Penn, um, which was uh, a case, uh, uh, an amazing case, because it was a case where two Quakers were charged uh, with a disturbance and they were brought to trial at the Old Bailey, and the judge effectively directed the jury to find them guilty, effectively. I'm, just, I'm summarizing itself. And the jury, at the end of the day, it's a long story, but refused to find them guilty. And he imprisoned the jury. And he, I mean, it's a fantastic story. And one juror called Bushel, effectively, he, I think he imprisoned for two nights without water and uh, without bread. Uh, you can get the details, but it's a fascinating case. And then the court uh, quashed and directed that a jury is entitled uh, to return a verdict according to its own conscience. So the jury process in England has a lot of history in it and has a lot of power, a lot of independence. Again, I would urge you, if you have time, those of you who study constitutional law and criminal law, to, to read the case of Clive Ponting, the civil servant who gave information and was acquitted by the jury of uh, breaching all sorts of Official Secrets Act. Um, so uh, finally, I would want to thank again, uh, first of all, all of you here to be here tonight uh, on an evening when I feel you would rather go out having a drink or two with your mates and have a laugh. Uh, I hope I have managed to captivate some of your imagination and to direct you to say the study of law is actually quite an important function, not only as a lawyer, 
But you know, law graduates and lawyers, when they study law, can become great negotiators. You can become great politicians, great diplomats, because it teaches you the, dis the, the discipline. So uh, thank you for coming here. Thank you, Soas, for inviting me. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, uh, Catherine Jenkins, for suggesting my name. And I'm deeply touched and humbled that I've been here today. And thank you all for being here. Thank you. Well, thank you, Michelle. I, what Michelle didn't mention, but what anyone here who understands the way this system knows, that we have a divided bar, right? So barristers take instructions. And we instructed this barrister to inspire. And I'm pleased to say that he more than fulfilled his instructions. And I, I, I hope you're all, we'll, we'll all join me in thanking Michelle for taking the time to come talk to us. Now, what I thought we would do now is I would put a few questions to both Michelle and Kevin. And when, I, when I first asked Michelle about the possibility of speaking here, we talked about titles and topics. And I came up with an alternative title in defense of criminal defense, because it seems to me we, we are now in an age, an age which I like to call the age of counter-terror rather than the age of terror, in which criminal defense is out of fashion and out of favor. So I thought that, that criminal defense itself needs a criminal barrister. And I would like both gentlemen here to address the special value and significance and the challenges of defending terrorism cases in this moment of counter-terror, when many of us are as concerned by the draconian response of states to terrorism as we are by the underlying phenomenon itself. So that's question one, right? What is the special value and significance of the defense of terror cases at this particular juncture? And since both of you have experience of the national and international criminal context, my, my, my second question is, how do you see the difference between them? I, I, I mentioned to Kevin the other day the irony that many of our students come here full of enthusiasm for international criminal law. But what gets them fired up is not inter international criminal defense, but international criminal prosecution. Whereas when they do the domestic criminal law cases, of course, many of our students gravitate toward defense. So once that anomaly, what's the difference between the defense, say, of war criminals and those accused of crimes against humanity on the one hand in an international context and the defense of those accused of terrorism and related offenses? Right, so those are my, my, my two questions and let me hand those over to you. You can answer them in any order you please. Okay, thanks. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and it's such an honor to stare the stage with such an engaging speaker and such a, um, uh, a lawyer of such an incredible reputation. I find it kind of wonderfully ironic that a, a nice Palestinian boy from Jerusalem and a nice Jewish boy from Boulder, Colorado both end up on the stage talking about a, a international Catholic, criminal a Catholic Palestinian. And a Catholic Palestinian. Um, <laughs> I want to turn more to, to more to the second the second question about this the the asymmetry or the difference between national and international criminal defense work because I started as a as an American criminal defense attorney doing domestic criminal law and now I do almost exclusively international criminal law and I can kind of lump terrorism in there that there really is a fundamental difference in the way that defense attorneys are perceived conservatives don't like defense attorneys of any stripe because they see them as just interposing themselves between justice and uh, you know, in, in defending impunity. Um, more progressive types, as you said, when they talk about domestic criminal defense, there's this idea that you know, the right to a defense and the individual versus the state and the defense attorney is, is the only person that stands between that individual and the machinery of the state. And there tends to be a great respect for criminal defense. Even, and I know I'm speaking more about the American experience, I think that even extends to terrorism cases where my progressive friends, you know, they hate Guantanamo Bay. They hate the military commissions, which are just a, a farce of justice. They respect the lawyers who fly down to Guantanamo Bay and, and defend the 9-11 conspirators. Those very same people are completely on the other side of the fence when it comes to international criminal law. 
All of a sudden, when you're defending an individual accused of a war crime or a crime against humanity or, God forbid, an act of genocide, all of a sudden you're doing the devil's work and not the angel's work anymore. And I don't quite know what the difference is, why they're, that when it comes to the international community, they see that as some kind of untrammeled good that is being frustrated by the defense, whereas when they look at an individual nation state, they see the evils of government power. And I think defense attorneys, and I think there's something characterologically different about defense attorneys, we don't make those kinds of distinctions. We see individuals who are faced with some kind of powerful machinery where their life or their liberty is at stake, and, and we insist that they get a defense. And, and I think it's very frustrating to see the demonization of defense attorneys, particularly at the international level. And, and a really good friend of mine is a man named Kareem Khan, who's also a QC, and I'm sure that Michelle knows well one of the most esteemed international criminal defense attorneys in the world. Uh, he's represented Kenyatta, the president of Kenya. He's the only defense attorney that I've ever actually heard prosecutors say that they're afraid of in court. He's an amazing lawyer. And very recently, he was recommended by a United Nations subcommittee to be the special rapporteur for torture, which they're now, which they've just appointed. Um, the subcommittee recommended five people for various different types of special rapporteurships. Four of them were approved by the Secretary General without a second thought, and Kareem Khan was immediately the target of a coalition of NGOs who argued to the United Nations, how could you appoint a defense attorney to be the special rapporteur for torture? You know, clearly if he's defended people like Kenyatta, he, he can't possibly represent victims. And putting aside the fact that he was a prosecutor, that he represented victims in Cambodia. The idea that by upholding the rights of a defendant at an international tribunal, somehow that makes you inherently opposed to the rights of victims and, and to compensation for victims, I found literally perverse. And he was the only one passed over. And it, it's, it's not an easy environment to function. And I'll end, because I want to hear what he has to say, with a personal anecdote which is when I agreed to represent Radovan Karadzic, which was just a few weeks after he was uh, arrested. Um, I mean, it wasn't a hard decision for me because I would defend anybody, um, but it was not one without costs. I lost friends uh, among human rights attorneys. Um, I got death threats fairly regularly on the phone and in email, and I'm sure every defense attorney who does that kind of work gets those eventually. Um, I was. My, front, my, my full color photo of me was plastered on the Sarajevo Times front page. I don't know why my picture was there and not Karadzic, but- you're handsome. Yeah, exactly, because I'm handsome, <laughs> that's distinguished. Um, you know, and, and, and it was, again, a, a fairly trying experience, but I want to end also on an optimistic note, which is the single best compliment that I've ever received, and it's a pretty low bar, but it was still a pretty significant compliment, was a young Bosniak man Bosnian Muslim, um, whose family had suffered terribly during the war in the Balkans at the hands of the Serbs and the Bosnian Serbs. Uh, I had met him a couple of times in The Hague because he was interning at the ICC. And you know, I had blogged about my death threats and all my friends that I had lost. And he sent me an email and he said, very simply, Kevin, I am so glad to know that you are defending Radovan Karadzic because when he's convicted, and I'm absolutely convinced that he will be convicted, all know that he's received a fair trial because you were involved in the case. And that's really the only thing that a defense attorney could ever possibly ask, is that level of understanding. We are not our clients. We do not adopt their agendas and their worldviews. We uphold their rights in a situation in which they are most often threatened. Um, and so the fact that someone who had suffered so grievously could understand that we were all part of the same system and also integral to the functioning of the system, that was really, makes all the other death threats and the loss of friends completely worthwhile. Well, th thank you, Kevin, for that tour de force as, as an answer. I think that's completely right because, uh, unfortunately, there is a misunderstanding about the role of the lawyer. Because when I lecture, say, in the Middle East, as I do, there is a kind of, um, like a box effect. If I defend whoever, they automatically think that I, him, or her, we are, hey, listen to me. I and President, whatever his name is, nothing. You know, I drink wine, I play chess, and I swim on Thursdays. Nothing with him, mate. I mean, it's just that, and in fact, if you look at, I'm not gonna mention the big international trial, where they hanged somebody, he was, he was defended by his very close mates. And that is the worst thing you can do. A doctor will never treat his own child, because you are too emotionally involved. If I'm gonna defend somebody with whom I'm politically close, 
I'm going to lose the case. Because if you are defending somebody and answering your question, a uh, very powerful question, if I may say, it is you need to have that distance so you can say to the client, this is a lot of rubbish, mate. I, I mean, the cases I have won, if you like, I mean, the case where I have come in and said, but your story, excuse my Greek, is a cock and bull story. So come on now, tell me. And you push a good lawyer, takes a client's account and pushes. And if finally the client says, I've done it, mate, say, okay, then you plead guilty. You, give him a, you get him a reduced sentence. But it is not the case that you go to your clients and say, all right, now, let's see what we can do. <laughs> it, it doesn't work like that. And so there's a misconception about the role of the defense lawyer. And that misconception, it is so negative because it really blurs the image. As you rightly said, Kevin, the role of the lawyer is to present a case on behalf of a client. I always give the case, always do the case. I always do this trick. It's like a party trick. I don't want to do it here. Don't have to. I put my watch here, close my eyes, pretend it's in his pocket, and the camera shows him there. But there are many reasons why it could have ended in your pocket. You could have stolen it, you could have given it as a gift, all sorts of reasons. But people immediately assume, immediately want to assume that the defense lawyer is somehow on the No, he isn't. The defense lawyer is simply the advocate. It, it's from the Latin, advocare. He's speaking on behalf of. I, it's just that God gave me, if you like, an ability to present an argument, perhaps that's sometimes, that's sometimes not attractively. Because sometimes you have a jury who looks at you and says, what, what's he on about? My only ability is I can tell from a jury that I'm on the wrong track and I change track. But, you know, that's our only art, isn't it? I mean, what would you say? Yeah, I completely agree. But I, I, could I add one thing? I, I, I do find very interesting reflecting on my experience as a domestic and an international criminal lawyer is because of the, of the magnitude of the international crimes, you expect, I'd be very curious to hear your thoughts on this, you would expect them to be monsters. You would expect them to, to, to radiate evil. And only one time in my entire career did I ever sit across from someone who I said to myself, wow, this is a scary dude. This is someone I really don't want to meet in a dark alley. And it was not an international criminal. Radovan Karadzic was perfectly friendly, and we discussed which was our favorite Monty Python movie the first time that I sat down with him. The only defendant I ever sat across from who scared the hell out of me was a man named Shug Knight, who was the founder of Death Row Records, and I, I wrote some of his appeal, and I had to go visit him in prison in Los Angeles. And he was the only person that I ever said to myself, this person is evil. And again, maybe it has something to do with that international crimes are much more about ideology than passion, but it's a very counterintuitive world, international criminal defense, and it is really, I think, fundamentally different than domestic criminal defense. It, it is def definitely. Firstly, the tribunal. First is, is the tribunal, it's judges, whereas in the, certainly in the UK, it's the jury with a different approach. But I just want to finish this on the point that you were saying earlier. I think uh, with the international criminal law, because the some of the atrocities are so incredible. I mean, the, the horrors of it are so, if you look at Cambodia, just away from the current crisis, Cambodia, I mean, it's just it's unbelievable, I mean, you know. Um, but yet, somebody has to prosecute and somebody has to defend, because you either believe in the concept of due process or you don't believe in due process. Because if you don't believe in due process, it means I suspect you now of uh, whatever it is, and I shoot you, I mean, so why have trials? So I, I mean, the answer to that question uh, Scott, always is to remind the, the, the person who asked the question is, would you rather live in a society where persons are guaranteed by right due process, or would you live in a jungle where I say, I think I saw you. I mean, I did, uh, I was going to talk about it, but maybe I was going to talk about the, uh, one of the first honor killing cases in the UK, where a Kurdish family had killed, um, they said, prosecution, their young 50-year-old daughter for honor killing, for honor reasons. Now, the, the point about this, I'm trying to say, it relates to this thing here, it comes to this point, is that in the mind of the person who does this act, at that moment when he, they did it, all sorts of images come to their mind, you see. And it answer to your question is, you have to take the client's instructions. Because if you don't, then like he did the killing of his daughter, then he should be killed immediately without due process. Because he, he, he never gave his daughter, allegedly, the chance to, to, to explain herself. He just killed her. And so you are applying the same law, which is a very base 
and wrong law because you're going to shoot the wrong person. You know, the ironic thing, of course, is that not too long ago, criminal defense lawyers defended only in a national context because that was the only context available, right? So the international arena is a relatively new one, leaving apart 1946. <laughs> so I, it, it, in returning to the conventional domestic arena, let me ask you, is defense harder now than it was in the current climate? Much, much I can speak with all the, much, much more difficult. I mean, it has always been difficult. There was a period under Bingham, Lord Justice uh, Bingham, uh, Lord, Lord, the Lord Chief Justice before he went to the Lords. He was, I think, epitomizes to me what the fair rules of justice was. If you read any of his judgments, he was an amazing man. I mean, Bingham, he died sadly. So he, was, he really understood the rules of fair play, and he actually applied them in practice. I mean, just any of you who are studying law, read the case of Mullins. I mean, an amazing judgment if there ever was one. On, on due process. On due process, he stopped trials. He was quite a, a powerful champion of that. So in answer to your question, there is now a clock going backwards a bit because there are restrictions on legal aid. I mean, when I started, uh, somebody charged with murder will automatically get a QC. Automatically. I mean, it, you didn't even ask. It would be considered outrageous if he wasn't given a QC. And so now the clock has moved. They try to... You know, there's a whole area of things that, that needs to be looked at very carefully. And I agree with you, there is much more restrictions. For example, lawyers, defense, I'm sure you went through the same experience. In England, we spend a lot of time asking for what we call unused material, i.e. material that the prosecution have amassed but have not used it in the case, which the defense may think may have a little uh, assistance. And so we spend a lot of time uh, seeking to do that. So in answer to your question, it is as fair as ever, I think, but it's slightly more difficult. Kevin, do you want to? Uh, I'll defer to his answer on that one. All right, now I think actually we, 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 we've been speaking for long enough up here, so let's turn things over to all of you and take 10, 15 minutes now to entertain questions. So let me ask for them in batches of three. So anyone? Yes. Um, I was just wondering whether, in your opinion, there is space. Hi, <laughs> down here. I, turn the phone. <laughs> I, I have bad eyes. <laughs> Believe me, it's not dramatic. I know I I'm, I'm an artist, well, but actually, too. the fourth row back, right? Right. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Hello. <laughs> thank you. It was wonderful. I really enjoyed it. But my question is with respect to whether, in your opinion, there is space for an ideological narrative in the prosecutions of crimes of terror, um, and kind of attached to that when a client, how do you navigate a client that insists on an ideological narrative being presented? So I did answer, I did answer the, second, the second limb of the question. The second limb of the, of the first how, question. So the second, yeah, the second part of it is how do you handle a client that insists on an ideological narrative being represented? Thank you. Hi. Uh, so I was uh, in a seminar once, and a famous barrister um, was uh, basically telling that he was asked to defend Pinochet uh, before the House of Lords. And his narrative goes that he, he thought about it, and then his wife told him, um, if you do defend Pinochet, then you'll also get a divorce. And um, he, he ended up not defending the guy and also cooperating with, with the prosecution in the case. Um, do you also respect uh, barristers actually, you know, turning down cases on, on moral grounds? Okay, so ideological narrative, personal stakes in criminal defense, and yes. Yeah, I mean, Thank you. Um, I'm very interested in law as regards in criminal law with regards to developing countries, and I'm a Nigerian. <laughs> And I have a question regarding the international front and developing countries as a whole. In what ways do you think um, criminal law has, at least in its policies and recent developments, sought to protect the rights of criminals and, and other people who have been prosecuted as well in developing countries, especially in Africa, 
with regards to making sure that the advocacy that's given to them in their trials are competent? And what can be done to improve this? Uh, if, if I may, uh, if I may, my lord, I would, since you dressed up like a lord today, I would like to begin with our uh, our friend there. Uh, firstly, in England, there is something called the cab rank rule, which applies to barristers. The cab rank rule, which still applies, which means that if a case comes to me through the solicitors uh, within an area that I specialize in, I'm not allowed to say I can't do it because I don't agree with the client. And that's a very important rule to protect people for, uh, uh, so that you know, the person charged with uh, very heinous crime gets still represented. In England, it's a sacrosanct thing. I can't comment on the specific case, but if it was true that the wife threatened divorce, I can tell you she could technically be found in contempt of court, but that's another story. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just teasing a bit. And, uh, uh, I, I think uh, in the Pinochet case, uh, uh, that was a fascinating case, and uh, the counter argument would have been uh, to defend him on the basis against extradition. So, uh, I, I, but that was my point. The first question that our lady asked here about the ideology, I, I've defended in virtually every terrorist case in the last uh, 30 years. I defended Armenians who tried to blow up the Turkish embassy, and if you read the transcripts, I mean, it's fascinating. Every conceivable nationality I've defended. Uh, so, uh, in the early days when I was a baby lawyer, the Irish cases, they would refuse to recognize the court. They would not, they would, when the judge comes in, they would not stand up. They would turn their backs to the court. They would not engage lawyers. So as a pupil, I was learning fantastic. Then they changed their policy. Then they said, no, we will go to people like Kevin, who are fantastic advocates. We shall instruct them. They, they went to a very famous solicitor called Gareth Pierce. You can Google her. There was a film made about her. Um, they would go to her, and she would instruct, in turn, great barristers uh, like Michael Mansfield, my colleague, and, and others, who would defend these major trials. I was a baby lawyer. I, uh, there are cases, there are stories I can tell, but not tonight. But uh, the answer to that is you cannot, in English court, run an ideological defense. In other words, you are charged with murder, say. The evidence against you, for the sake of argument, is that your fingerprint appears on the wires of the bomb, say. Okay? Bah. Uh, you, 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 it seems you have three choices. You say, I don't know why. Uh, the wire came from my auntie's garden. I was fixing her bulb. I mean, I don't know what you're going to say. But you have to give an explanation, right? You know, I can think of many. I'm not going to tell you what excuses there are, but, but what you ideologically you want to say, yes, I planned to blow up uh, whatever it is because I believe in, well, you can say that, but you'll get uh, 36 years uh, minimum. Uh, and, you know, you'll, you'll, it will be glorious, but, you know. Yeah. Uh, but I, I'm sorry, so the simple answer, that there isn't, and I, you cannot say to the court, my client believes in the justice of whatever case he or she believes in and believes in blowing up whatever. You know, and it will be wrong. It will be, and you as a lawyer will say to him or her, terribly sorry, my dear chap, uh, the evidence against you is ABC. What's your answer to the evidence? If he or she has no answer, then say, my advice to you is to plead guilty. And uh, as every young lawyer says, which never happens in real life, I th my client throws herself at the mercy of the court, because we never do, but that's in the movies, certainly. Maybe I just I want to pick briefly up on the first question as well, because um, I, I think it's different at the international level. I think the room for pushing particular historical narratives is much greater. And it can be very frustrating if you are a lawyer who's interested in a legal defense with a client who is not interested in a legal defense, but a historical one. And, and we very much face that issue in the Karadich case, where my colleague and I, who were basically responsible for his day-to-day -day defense, also had to deal with his kind of somewhat crazy Serbian lawyers. And we would sit in these rooms discussing strategy, and we're lawyers, we're not Serbs, we're not interested in a historical narrative. Our best defense was to point our finger at Mladic, the head of the Bosnian Serb army, and say, he did it, and he and my client hated each other, because Karadis and Mladic did hate each other. That's the legal defense. But that's not what the Serbian lawyers were interested in. The Serbian lawyers were interested in making sure that Karadic reinforced the basic kind of 
uh, paranoid Serbian line that they were all victims, that everything is being trumped up by the West. Um, and I would sit in these meetings and, and listen to these Serbian lawyers say, we have powerful new forensic evidence that, that only 400 people were murdered at Srebrenica and that all of them were, were men between the ages of 18 and 35. And, and you're sitting there thinking to yourself, a, your, your evidence is ridiculous, but B, no one cares at this point. The, that Srebrenica genocide ship has sailed, and this is not the way to pursue a defense. But if your client insists on basically uh, accepting the fact that they're going to be convicted at the international level and still wanting to have their, their last say to an international audience, there isn't very much you can do. But it's extremely frustrating. Um, can I just add, I mean, in the English context, for example, there was... Uh, I forgot the names, sadly, but there was a very famous spy called Blake. I can Google it. Very famous spy, Soviet spy, the height of the Cold War. And he escaped from a top security prison, helped by two uh, sympathizers. I think one of them was called Potter. I mean, it's a very, and they wrote a book. Um, so 30 years on, so he escapes. He's back in the Soviet Union. Hallelujah, eating, you know, caviar and uh, vodka and singing, you know, Nazdrovia, Nazdrovia. And the two guys, you know, now in their 60s, wrote a book saying how brilliant they were, bringing, you know. So the police said, hello, <laughs> hello, this is a confession. So they said, good morning, I am Detective Constable Jamie Edwards, and this is Detective Chief Superintendent, whatever. And so they arrested them, and they put them on trial for a very serious offense. And they came to their lawyers and said, wow, we, we, we want to run. You just remember, that we want to run an ideology, you know, they admitted the whole thing in the book, but we, we are not guilty for reasons which they gave. So the lawyer said, well, that's very interesting, but we as barristers and QCs, we cannot put forward on your behalf to the jury this cock and bull, unbelievable, incredible story. Client, client said, thank you very much, it's very decent of you, thank you, bye-bye. So they defended themselves, and, the, and they said to the jury, look, we are sympathizers, the case is 35 years old, right? Uh, these guys did nothing wrong, I mean, whatever it is, they defended Blake themselves, each one of them. And after many days and trials and evidence, the jury came back and said, thank you, not guilty. So, uh, <laughs> so the, the barristers withdrew. So in answer to your question, the lawyer is not allowed by the rules of the profession to, to put in this ideological defense. It can be part of the background. If you, for example, explain it, to explain to the jury why you did something, but you that could be, but they, they, that was one of the most amazing cases in modern times. I forgot the name, I think it was P Potter, one of those, Potter, I'll check it. Anyway. We can Google that. We can Google, Google, Mr. Google. <laughs> I wasn't quite sure what the specific question was. Do you want to rephrase your question, please? I was basically asking. What Nigeria? What ways um, criminal law policies and renovations have taken into account um, protecting advocacy rights of criminals in developing countries, for example, West Africa. Well, sorry, developing countries within continents like Africa. So any, uh, the, 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 the distinctive significance of criminal defense in a developing country context, is that? Yeah. Well, I mean, one could give, you know, a kind of a, a highfalutin answer, which is, and it's not limited to just the developing world, but in any country that has experienced really societal rendering, rending conflict, part of the process of, of reconstruction is reconstructing the judiciary and reconstructing the lawyers. After Rwanda, there was, after the Rwandan genocide in 1994, by some estimates, there were no judges and less than 10 qualified lawyers left in the country. So part of what happens in the wake of conflict is rebuilding the judicial system. And if you don't insist on the rule of law in rebuilding a system from the start, if you don't take seriously the defense function just as much as the prosecution function, I, I don't think you can build a mature legal system. And, and if countries like the United States are, are struggling to build fair judicial systems, countries that have far fewer resources than the United States, you can only imagine how difficult it is. And so I think part of it is insisting upon the rule of law in its robust sense, not in rule of law in terms of convicting as many people of crimes as possible, yeah. but insisting that you convict as many people as fairly as possible. Well, in, in deference to our speakers and indeed to our audience, let, let me take three more questions and then we will adjourn the reception. So, <coughs> yes, on two, three. 
Hi. Um, I wanted to ask the man behind the, the lawyer. I know you partially answered. The man the, behind? Which man? The, the lawyer. Oh, yeah. any, any man. <laughs> um, I, I, I knew. I knew I was not supposed to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I completely agree that if you firmly believe in due process, you can defend anyone for whatever they did. And if they're freed because you've managed to convince a jury, then that's completely fine. But what about when you free someone on the base of a um, small failure in procedure, for example? How do you cope with that on a personal level? Is, is that for this man or the man behind me? <laughs> I'm just teasing. Don't worry. Uh, it's, a good, it's a good question. It's a good question. Well, it, it, it does burn me out. <laughs> um, thanks again, both of you, for sharing some, some really uh, amazing anecdotes. Um, uh, and as a practicing lawyer previously myself, I, I, I share your views that if you have the opportunity to work in another jurisdiction, it's, it's a great experience. The question it relates to the perception, as reported in the media, that um, institutions like the ICC and so on um, are perceived negatively in other countries. Uh, and I'm just wondering if you might share your thoughts on whether or not you feel um, that's fair uh, or it's just a reality. And if it is just a reality, what can be done to improve the perception in countries like Africa and so on that you know, Africans are being persecuted more than, I don't know, uh, other people. Thank you. Um, sh shall I deal with the first question? About, yeah, sure. I, yeah. uh, I, 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 I mean, thank you for the question. I mean, as, that supports my view that every dinner party I get similar questions. And so even these, which is interesting. I, it is a human nature to ask always this kind of almost what I call the Graham Greene battle. Uh, how, does you, how do you wrestle with your conscience at night? Well, I don't, because I start with the point that every person is presumed by law innocent. I actually believe that. I mean, if you don't believe it, you mustn't practice law, okay? Then it is for the prosecution under our system to prove guilt. Thirdly, they must prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. And these are the three elements for me, from a practical point of view, of due process, okay? So you, ha you have to have that ingrained in your psyche, as it is in mine. Because I've seen so many miscarriages of justice where people have tried to you know, speed up a process or cut a corner here the, by the prosecution, and it always ends up bad. I can tell you stories, I'm not going to tell you, but there have been substantial miscarriages of justice which have taken place. For example, when the emotions are high during the IRA campaign, there was a woman who was arrested and she was charged with serious terrorist offenses. She confessed to being the brains behind a whole series of bombings in London. 26 years later, 26 years later, the Court of Appeal quashed all her convictions, apologized to her, realizing that the lady was not mentally well, she should never have been arrested, and the police had, over, had, 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 had overlooked that, and she should never have been charged. And so the point I'm saying to you, is if you turn the clock back, the person who would have spotted how ill that lady was would have been a hero, don't you think? Uh, you see, um, it's very difficult to translate that powerful question that you ask me to the realities of courtroom drama because, you see, when I'm faced with a case, I have to say, well, what's the evidence? Say it's a murder. Uh, say the fingerprint is on the knife. Do we have time for a story? Would you like to hear a story? Yes. That all of you? Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm gonna change a little bit the story because it's too sensitive, but I, I defended, I, I was just becoming QC, right? So they gave it to me on the basis, ah, he's gonna lose it, so I gave it to him. You know? And the evidence was, I mean, honestly, seriously overwhelming, okay? These are the facts, and you be the judge, okay? So, what's your name? Uh, Manuk. 
Menon, okay. Now, this, this is the fact. This is what the police found. The police come to a disused garage and they find a man stabbed to death. A knife had been stabbed in his heart and then they, his, his body was soaked in blood. He was lying in a pool of blood and they found footprints of blood and handprints on the blood, like on the wall, like this. And not, not far from the scene, they find a shirt soaked in blood as well. Okay. And um, two days later, they arrest, as it turned out, my client, and his fingerprints match the fingerprints on the wall, his fingerprints match fingerprints on the knife, and the blood of the victim is on his hair, right? And what the experts call the shower effect. If, God forbid, I was to stab Kevin, the blood will go up, it will come on me, depending on how we are positioned. So there was evidence. Now, would you say that evidence was pretty overwhelming against my client? Yeah? Yeah, fingerprints on the knife? The blood of the victim on his shirt? And I did not tell you, because I we are, we are running at speed, uh, he had legged it for two, for two days. When the police arrest him, he says, moi, are you crazy? I was never there. I was with my girlfriend, Lolita. Okay, I'm changing the name. <laughs> All right, what do you want me to tell you her, her full name, address? No. She, so she, she, he said, he, he gave a defense of what we call alibi. Okay? He gave the, and so, of course, do you all agree his defense of alibi is insane? Because clearly, he must have been, do you all agree he must have been at the scene? Yeah. Yeah. Any dissenters? No? He was at the scene, right? Okay. So the police clearly charged him with murder. He has lawyers. The lawyers say, listen, uh, very sorry, my dear chap. It's a very interesting case, but really, you have to plead guilty. This is the most overwhelming case we've seen since Magna Carta. And uh, <laughs> I, I, I tell you, and, and, he told, and he told them to, I, I won't use the words he used, but he told them basically to. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so uh, he sacked them. He then comes to the solicitors who end up instructing me, and they called me. They said, Look, we have a hopeless case. He refuses to plead guilty. It's pretty damning. He is guilty as sin. But would you do us a favor? Look, Michelle, you're a baby silk. You're a baby QC. Come on, just a bit of money for you. Ah, I like a challenge. I go and see the client. He is furious. He's swearing. He is absolutely mad. So, of course, I look at the case, I study the papers, and I say, senor, because I speak some Spanish, I say, senor. I'm so sorry. I will, not, I will not do the accent. I say, you are guilty of sin. And I say, I have to plead guilty, but I'll get you a good deal. I know the prosecutor. And he said, you are exactly like them. I said, look, but you have not given me any explanation because the evidence looks like that. I said, look, think about it. If I have an explanation that explains your, because you could not have been with Lolita. There is no way you could have been with Lolita. I can, whatever else, you know, is right. Um, you know, the Pope is the, king of all nastiness in the world. He cannot, you know, anyway, I left him. A week later, Sarissa says, he liked you, come back. So, go back, yes? He starts crying. He says, I like you. I could say I like you too. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yes? He said, uh, and of course he said, uh, nobody will believe me, you won't believe me. I said, no, no, try me. So he said, and he, t he told this, so he said, I'm a drug dealer. The victim is a drug dealer. The day in question, I came to give him some, to buy my drugs from him. I mean, not for his personal, but to sell. He was a bit. As I came in to buy the drugs from that place, I rushed in, I heard him sounding, oh, like that. I rushed, and I saw him dying with the knife in his heart. So I rushed, I quickly grabbed the knife, pulled it out, and as he was expiring almost, he said to me, in Spanish, of course, hold me. I, I held him, and then I heard footsteps. I'm an illegal immigrant, I'm a drug dealer, and I'm wanted by the police in three countries. So I dropped the body, and I ran. Yes, I lied, I was not with Lolita, I was at the scene. Now, do you all think, including you, uh, Mademoiselle, that <laughs> his story has some credibility now? Okay, so you see, it is fascinating, don't you think, Scott? Because when he told us a closer <coughs> version, closer to the truth as it happens, and we analyzed it, we got a forensic expert, we got everybody. 
All I will tell you is, who, who do you think he was acquitted? Come on, show me hands. Who do you think was acquitted? Don't be timid. I can't see because of the light. There's a, there's a lot of hands. <laughs> Lots of hands. Yeah. Well, I got him off. He was acquitted of all the charges. And coming to your question, I, I was asked that same question. Don't you feel terrible? He's a criminal. And three years later at the Old Bailey, officer of the case says, oh, very sorry, sir. I'm going to tell you something. So what, what? We've nicked the guy what did it. So, in fact, we acquitted the innocent man and the police. And the no, police. Not the evidence. The problem was that he didn't trust his lawyer until he met you. Well, but, well, not, well the, point, the evidence pointed to his guilt. You see, the evidence, Scott, pointed only one way. And if you take the example here, it points, I mean, I could tell you many cases, it points to guilt. So you, you have to get the client to sufficiently trust you so he, can, he or she can tell you um, a, 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 the truth. And in this case, he was acquitted, and the police three years later told me they got the real man. So it's, I slept well. Kevin, do you have a story? I don't have a story, but I, I guess I have an answer, a very quick one. Um, the way that I tell the, um, his answer is to say that, you know, that I, I don't believe that we should say defense attorneys get defendants off. I think we should say prosecutors don't get them in because it's the prosecutor's job to put yeah. them away. And if anybody is supposed to feel horrible after an acquittal, it should be the prosecution and not the defense because we don't have the burden. But I know that sounds like a very bloodless answer. And in, in my confession, and I think actually the man to my right mis disproves this, um, is that you know, I, I think there really is something characterologically different about defense attorneys. The way I usually say it, and this is what you disprove, is that all good defense attorneys have a little touch of a sociopath in them because they're able to, <laughs> because they're able to, 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 to detach themselves from the consequences of criminal behavior. Not all of your clients are miraculously innocent. Some of them are guilty. And you have to be able to, to say, the values I'm upholding are more important than the short-term consequences. And that's not for everybody. And it comes back to your question that, you know, I actually do, I, I painfully admit this, I actually do look down on defense attorneys who really pick and choose what kinds of cases they won't do. Absolutely. In the United States, it's very, no defense attorney ever becomes a prosecutor in the United States. But in the US, prosecutors become defense attorneys. But they don't become, they don't defend the murderers and the rapists and the terrorists. They defend the tax frauds and the securities fraud, you know, the, the good type of defendant. And you'll often hear them talk about good defendants and bad defendants. And to me, that's not, that's, you're, you're not a criminal defense attorney if you're only willing to defend certain kinds of crime. Now, I think all defense attorneys should get one type of crime that they won't do. I, the one of the best attorneys I've ever met in my entire life who was a federal public defender in Phoenix, Arizona, he'd defend rapists, he would defend murderers, he would defend terrorists. He would not defend people who blew up waterfalls in national parks. And in Arizona, people like to blow up waterfalls. And he just liked nature, and he liked waterfalls, and he thought it was such a horrible thing to blow up a waterfall that he could not zealously defend someone. So everybody gets one. But the point is, if you can't make that separation, if you can't live with yourself, if your client is the one who gets acquitted and then goes off to kill again, you can't really be a defense attorney. And so I'm not, I don't ever tell people that everybody should become a defense attorney, but I think we should all be happy that there are at least some sociopaths out there who are willing to play that role in the system. We have a quick response to the question. I mean, I, yeah, quick, I mean, it's, it's a, unfortunately, it's a long response. Um, you know, I mean, international criminal justice is completely imperfect. It's completely selective. Um, but the real problem is not that innocent people are always being prosecuted. Sometimes they are. Most of them are not. Most of them are guilty. The problem is we're not prosecuting enough guilty people. It's not that Kenyatta, the president of Kenya, shouldn't be prosecuted. The point is that George Bush and Dick Cheney and Rumsfeld and Blair, they should be prosecuted as well. So I, but. <laughs> I was, I was totally pandering with that. Yeah, you know your audience. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the point is, and I used this in my international criminal law class last week, the people who are prosecuted at tribunals, they're not scapegoats. Scapegoats are innocent people who are being sacrificed to make a larger point. They're not innocent people being sacrificed. They're guilty people who unfortunately are surrounded by equally guilty people who are not being brought to justice. And I'm not a huge 
defender of international criminal justice. So if you're looking to, to, for a hopeful end, I don't really have one, other than to say, and I think this comes back to your question, if you want to look at one thing that we can actually point to in international criminal law that gives us hope for the future, it's the Habre case in Senegal. You have an African country prosecuting the head of state of another African country for international crimes via universal jurisdiction. If this area of law has a future, it will be that kind of global south prosecution, and to me, not the international criminal courts and the international criminal tribunal for the former Yugoslavians. So, so would both of you agree that the hole through which you could drive an articulated law in criminal defense on both the national and the international levels is prosecutorial discretion? Well, I don't think any defense attorney is ever happy with the answer, prosecutors will use their discretion wisely. I, I think evidence tends to not bear that assertion. I, I, I think nowadays, frankly, because of the cuts in England, in England there is a, a tendency to shift onto the other person. So if you've got a marginal case, you say, let the jury decide. That's a kind of, in other words, there is not enough discretion at the lower level of the Crown prosecution. So say, this is nonsense, this case cannot go. Because everyone's frightened, oh my God, oh! I stopped the case, what can I do? It's terrible. I think people, much, many, more, many less cases should be prosecuted because they, they don't pass the 50% uh, evidential test. Anyway, enough. All right, with great reluctance, I'm going to cut things off now. And I'm going to thank our speakers for speaking. Particularly to that one. <laughs> our speaker and I discussed it. They were talking to us so compellingly, and I want to thank all of you for yeah. listening so intently. Yeah. Their job is hard. Our job is easy.